Mr. Chairman. The Honourable Peter Dunn. Mr. Chairman, can I thank those members who have taken part in the debate so far for, for their constructive and very useful comments? And I want to take some time to comment on some of the matters that they've raised and the questions that they've posed. Uh, can I begin by taking a phrase that the previous speaker used, and she spoke of the need to maintain a careful balance, and I think that's a very accurate description, actually, of what we're trying to do with this piece of legislation. Uh, the House may be amused to know that my uh, first association with the old Alcoholism and Drug Addiction Act was in 1983, when I was the chair of the Wellington Coordinating Committee on Alcohol and Drugs, and we decided then that the 1966 legislation, which was but a child of only 17, was well and truly outdated. So here we are, uh, as the Act passes into its 50th year, finally putting it to a gentle rest. Mr. Speaker, there are, uh, Mr. Chairman, there are a number of points that I, that I want to pick up, but I guess the starting point is to be very clear about who and what it is we are talking about here. We are not talking about people who suffer temporary or passing intoxication from alcohol and drugs. We are talking about people who have a severe, progressive, long-term addiction that has proved difficult to treat in any other environment. So immediately the audience is a limited one. Uh, a speaker earlier referred to a couple of hundred patients a year. I think that is probably uh, at the outer margin but it's a very small and discreet number. Uh, let me just pick up some of the issues, therefore, that members have, have, have raised. Uh, Poto Williams raised questions about uh, gaps in capacity in terms of the ability to provide treatment services and timeframes. And she's right to make that point. And one of the reasons why the Select Committee recommended, and I certainly accept the recommendation, of a, of a one-year lead-in to the implementation of the bill, so it doesn't take effect until 2018, is to ensure that we have both as adequate a range of facilities as we can get by that time, but we also have knowledge and awareness amongst the health professionals who will be working with these people, and that we will have identified some of the gaps in capacity. Mr Chairman, this legislation is a culture step forward from the previous legislation. And so those health professionals who will have formed a view of the inadequacy of the current legislation will need to be brought along to understand that there's a new environment that is more reflective of their needs and therefore more able to respond to the types of circumstances that they face with their particular patients. Which brings me to the point that Louisa Wall made about the principles of informed consent and do no harm. Uh, one of the really important issues that's here, I think, the health, is that the health profession generally, I think, understands the principle of informed consent. But in this instance, you come back one. The issue at heart here is not so much informed consent, but the capacity of the person to be able to consent. And that's going to open up another range of issues for the health sector and those working with these people as to how that consent is contained. Is it of a quality that is sufficient uh, for purpose? Mr Speaker, the, the next set of issues um, that arise if you, uh, are if you look at the clauses of the bill post clause 7, you'll see that they really try to address uh, this particular concern. Clause 10 makes it very clear that compulsory treatment is the option of the last resort. And I think that's an important point because often one comes across families who will be just absolutely frustrated that their particular loved one is in a downward spiral and nothing seems to be able to, do, be, to be done to intervene to help them. So by making it clear that we are looking to people who have severely impaired capacity, that's defined in clause nine, that this is treatment of last resort in clause 10, that there are very particular provisions around what is appropriate treatment, the duration of that treatment, and the protection of the rights of the individual during that treatment. We're trying to strike what you know, Julianne Gentle described as that careful balance between dealing with a problem that in its enormity other people need to see the need has to be resolved, while respecting the rights and the integrity of the individual who's the subject of the legislation. And that, I think, is where the current legislation fell down, because the way it was designed in 1966 was still at the time when we had public drunkenness as an offence, 
And if one reads, uh, Mr. Chairman, Peter if one reads the social commentaries of people like James K. Baxter at the time, this sort of legislation was actually used in a way to get people off the streets, find that they didn't have adequate means of support, suspect they had an alcohol or drug problem, bang, the ANDA Act suddenly starts to apply. We've moved on from that environment. And I think it fell into disrepute because society had moved on also. What this legislation tries to do is recognise that there are people out there with genuine problems and genuine needs, and we as a compassionate society need to have in place mechanisms that help them through that addiction and hopefully, and we can never be confident of this, but hopefully set them on the path to living reasonable and sustainable lives in the future. Mr Chairman, I hope that it's not 50 years before we have this debate again. Uh, I suspect many of us won't be here at that time, and in that regard, I'm delighted that the Select Committee's recommended... I probably will be, yes. Um, <laughs> I'm delighted that the Select Committee has recommended a three-year review, because I think that ensures that the legislation remains current. I also think it ensures two other things. Firstly, that the points that Larissa Wall made about this whole issue of consent and how that's applied will have been tested, and if it's proved to be uh, deficient in the legislation, we'll be able to address it. And secondly, the question that a number of members have raised about the adequacy of our services will have been identified and tested as well. So, Mr Chairman, I thank those members who have spoken for their support and for their questions, and while it's... Um, I suppose this is a bit like the tortoise and the hare. Uh, the, the tortoise is going to win eventually, uh, uh, but not just tonight. Thank you. Members, we move to the...